Before we start the show, just the shameless advertising part of the program. Uh, if you are shopping on Amazon.com or want to get something from Home Depot, would you consider using our affiliate link? We get a little finder's fee if we send people to those sites. Uh, Amazon, you just go to GardenFork.tv and there are links there. There's also links in the show notes for this program uh, on your iPhone. There'll be a clickable link actually in the show notes here. And Home Depot, if you want to order a bunch of stuff or even one item, you can order it online and then pick it up at your store. And that saves some time. Uh, I needed some shower valve valves, which they didn't have in stock. So I ordered them online. They shipped them to the store and I went and picked them up. So that saves on shipping. And I needed to buy some extra piping anyway for that job. So that worked out well. All right, so the links are in our show notes, and there's ads on the right-hand side of our website as well for homedepot.com and amazon.com. Those are affiliate links. We get a little finder's fee if you shop with us. Start with us and shop there. Okay, here we go. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Garden Fork Radio. You're here with just Eric. Um... In typical Eric fashion, Rick and I recorded a show last weekend, and then it sat on my computer, and I was like, oh, I need to edit that, and I got over, not overwhelmed, which is also an Eric trait, Uh, I got distracted, which is the ADD part of me, Um, and I did not get to edit the show, and I thought, oh, I'll just edit it on the weekend up at the little weekend house, and I realized I didn't bring the file with me, the audio file. And I don't want to bug Rick again to say, hey, I, I messed up. Could we do another one? So I thought you'd get the Eric Solo Show, which I try every once in a while. And most people say it sounds pretty good. So I'm going to do another one here. I thought I would read and respond to some comments that have been on the site. And also um, just reflect on the recent weather we've been having here. Right now, it, the wind is whipping. It is 9 degrees above zero. And the winds are gusting to 10 or 15 so it's like minus three to minus 10, depending on uh, which weather station I look at. Wicked cold here on a Saturday. And who wants to go outside? The knuckleheads. So uh, the Labradors are outside. The camera operator just took them out and I thought I would take this opportunity to have quiet in the house to record a quick show, all right? Uh, on the East Coast here, we had a uh, storm Juno, winter storm Juno hit us. And we were in New York City and there was a lot of Well, just a lot of local news coverage about it. And I'm always surprised at how New York City local news is carried through uh, news stations throughout the country to the point that people in Los Angeles are like, hey, Eric, uh, we're hearing about the snowstorm, which I just find interesting because I don't hear about other towns news in New York City. Um, So it wasn't uh, nearly as bad as everyone said it would be. It really whacked Boston more. But what I thought was interesting was I read in the New York Times about the different weather modeling uh, model, uh, they're called models, storm models, calculations they do to figure out what a storm is going to do and where it's going to go. There's a European model and an American model, and evidently the European model, I don't know why it's called that, has been more accurate lately. And this storm more followed the modeling of the American model, the American calculation. But the point uh, that I want to make here and that I read in the New York Times article, which we will link to in our show notes here, is that if you're off by a couple of degrees, uh, and in in other words, radial degrees, like 45 degree angle, a degree of angle, at the beginning of the storm, you can be way off when it moves 50 miles or something. So this storm was out in the ocean and starting to whip, looked like counterclockwise, I think onto the east coast and the fact that maybe the calculations were a little different at the get-go from where the storm is it didn't hit new york like we were supposed to get two feet of snow in new york city and we got about six to eight inches which is very doable um it did whack the northern coast but it was interesting the other thing to think about is that this storm was kind of a had three different factors where we always get our a lot of weather from the west and it's always influenced by weather coming up from the south. And then we have, I guess they call it the polar vortex. We have weather from the north coming down as well. So it kind of hits and makes this perfect storm thing. 
That being said, there was a lot of hoopla about, well, why'd they shut down the highways? Why'd they shut the, the subways down? And I actually think that they should shut down the roads more often. I think a lot of people are out on the road when they really shouldn't be. Um, you know, I think all wheel drive kind of gives people an invincibility that they shouldn't have. Um, state of Connecticut, they shut down the highways, I think at like eight or nine o'clock at night on Monday night. And in the span of 24 hours after that, and they got a, a medium amount of snow, there were only 11 car accidents in that 24 hour period and one serious injury. So if you can imagine if they didn't close down the roads and it was like an eight inch snowstorm, how many more accidents you would have had. So I thought we should actually, you know, close this down more often. It does have an economic effect, but this storm was supposed to hit at night and they're like, just, just stay home. Uh, you know, you're, there are a lot of local businesses that'll take a hit from that, but in the bigger picture, you'll also have less accidents. Um, and I think that's a good thing. So that was just my thought on that. If you guys are weather geeks, I'd like to hear from you about that. The other cool thing about a storm is I wrote about this in our weekly email, but it's kind of a, it's an icebreaker opportunity to reach out to your neighbors if you don't know them very well or, or just a reason to go check on them. Uh, if you have some older neighbors, you can just go over and knock on the door and say, hey, I'm going to the store. Do you need some milk before the storm? And that can lead into a conversation about, you know, is there anything that needs fixing in your house? I could come over. Uh, a lot of people are reluctant to ask for help. And if you offer it in not a real blunt way, but a kind of a subtle way, you know, hey, you know, I'd, if there's a little something that needs to be tweaked. Um, and I, it's also just a way to, even if you think your neighbors are self-sustaining, you could just go over there and say, hey, I'm running down to the store before the storm. Do you need anything? And that can pay off dividends down the road. Um, the flip side of that is that on my block, actually, I uh, have two friends and there was an issue with a parking spot. And my one friend, I think, was really out of line. And these two people don't know each other very well. They both know me. And I said to the person, you know, you that's your neighbor and you're both going to live here a really long time. So maybe you shouldn't have acted that way. Um, it was kind of a little petty thing, but... Uh, a lot of times the moment gets you wound up and you don't think about the bigger picture. And so think about that. <laughs> That's just Eric being deep thought there. But, you know, that kind of thing can carry on for years. There was, a, there was an incident with two of my neighbors a long time ago. And the one neighbor, every time I see them, they bring it up. Oh, well, you know, when so-and-so did that. And now my phone is uh, binging. Sorry about that. So, um. There you go. Deep thoughts from Eric about just getting along with your neighbors. But go knock on the door or call them. You know, it's just a, it's just the thing to do. What's really cool, we are up in Connecticut. Um, I know my neighbors here, and they actually call, and they're like, okay, the power's still on, because the big deal up here is when the power's going to go out. And luckily, the power didn't go out. Uh, when the power goes out, you know, I have a manual generator, um, and I have to hook it up and run it. So that means I have to come up here. And um, thankfully, the power didn't go out, so we were lucky. Usually, it seems like whenever anything rains, the power goes out up here. Again, we talk about generators a lot on the site. If you're thinking about installing a portable generator, you will need a transfer switch. And, of course, we have links on our, to our site in the show notes about this. I'm actually going to be helping a, a friend of mine who just bought a transfer panel. He has a generator already, and it seems like the transfer panel is kind of this mental hump that people have to get over because it's not a cheap piece of equipment but it's incredibly important uh safety wise there would you guys like some viewer mail kind of some uh recent comments on the site i've been going through um a big apology about the banana bread recipe i forgot the egg um i forgot to include the egg in the recipe and the the recipe the video shows an egg being mixed with the butter and I did not uh, put one egg in the recipe list so specifically Becky if you're listening uh, I'm very sorry about that I did email her and apologize as well bad Eric speaking of bad uh, pizza oven uh, Doug wrote in and said uh, we have a video about making pizza in your fireplace which is a perfect winter thing to do especially when the wind is whipping out there um, 
His name is Doug and said, hey there, cooked pizza in our fireplace over the weekend. I just used a pizza pan and put it on top of some bricks in the fireplace. I'm thinking the bricks were probably in with the coals. Took a couple tries to figure out the best heat and height to place the pan at. The crust turned out superb, but the toppings didn't quite cook. I like the idea of that Dutch oven chicken fryer pot, but I'm going to keep looking for the right thing for directing heat to the top of the pizza. When I find it, I'll let you know. You know what works really well is actually a metal garbage can lid. <laughs> <laughs> or a like a 13 by 9 uh, big flat cake pan if you want to make like a big thing of cornbread or a big thing of uh, apple crisp or something. You basically want to direct heat coming from the bottom, in other words, from the fire, hit the metal and, and bounce the heat back onto the top of the pizza. I've also seen where people put... Uh, Basically, they have a fireplace uh, cooking grate, then they put a brick or two on it, and then they put a bread stone on top of that, and that is essentially the top of their pizza oven. They let that heat up, and then they slide it in. Or you could use the top lid of like a big turkey roasting pan. I've seen that used to make like no-need breads or artisan breads where you don't have a Dutch oven, or the bread loaf is of a shape that doesn't fit in a Dutch oven. Uh, they will use the top of a big turkey roaster pan. So I'm thinking I want to hit up like a dollar store or a tag sale and if someone has a cheap roaster pan I'll buy it just for the lid and I'll be experimenting with that. So there you go. Uh, we just did some episodes on making polenta. We did pressure cooker polenta and then microwave and a quick stovetop polenta. And in the microwave and stovetop polenta recipes, we included a little bit of baking soda, which is a tip I got from the America's Test Kitchen people. Um, using baking soda in cooking is coming a, is becoming a bigger and bigger thing. I think it's part of the modernist cuisine movement is discovering this. Um, but yeah, it can help you. It can help make spaghetti noodles taste like ramen noodles. There's a blog post on Lucky Peach which is a magazine, but also um, a website um, about that, which I will link to. Pretty interesting. But Myra wrote in, and Myra writes in a lot. I like that. Hi, Eric. Love the polenta videos. I grew up eating mush from plain old regular cornmeal and water made on the top of the stove. I put the cornmeal in some cold water first to soak while the water in the pot comes to a boil. I then whisk in the soaked cornmeal and let it stir for a bit. It pops like lava. Yes, it does. And she says, quite entertaining, but watch out. When it's the consistency I want, I put some in a bowl with butter, sugar, and a little milk and eat it as eat it that way as the cook's treat, which I like too. The rest goes in the loaf pan straight away, goes into the fridge, and then she slices it, and I fry it the next day like you did, and we eat it with butter and syrup. I don't think it takes forever to make whatever the method and maybe using regular cornmeal would be the difference given it's ground finer and gives a less toothy consistency than using grits would. But then it wouldn't would it be the mush of my childhood, at least not in my house. I wonder if soaking the cornmeal achieves the same result as the baking soda. When soaked in water, the cornmeal doesn't clump up when dumped into the boiling water like pouring dry does. And I assume the meal has softened so it shortens the cooking time. Whatever the science behind it, it's good stuff. Yeah, great. So yeah, what you're doing with cornmeal, uh, the polenta, is you are softening the uh, different parts of the corn kernel so that they'll become homogenous and also kind of gelatinous. Um, they thicken kind of like a gluten in a way. And I got a whole bunch of comments about whether the corn grits package that I used was really corn grits because in the South, grits are made from corn that has been soaked in an alkali, um, typically lye or, you know, baking soda is an alkali as well. Something to think about there. So yeah, um, you can make it from regular cornmeal and I mean, you can make it really quick. It does kind of bloop, bloop, bloop. It, looks like, it looks like lava and you should whisk it quite a bit. I think the whisk, I don't use it a lot, but for making polenta, the whisk is great because I put it in the pressure cooker and then when it's done, some of the water kind of separates from the polenta and I take a whisk and I just whisk it all together and then boom, all of a sudden it comes together and it's a beautiful thing. So I love that. All right, uh, more pressure cooker talk. Linda writes, I have a uh, page on the site 
Um, pressure cooker reviews what to buy because I've got I get the question so much I finally just wrote an article about it on the site and there are affiliate links in the on that page to uh, Amazon and about the pressure cooker I like which is the Fagor duo uh, again the, the link will be in the show notes here if you want to buy one and Linda writes and says I have the Fagor duo I purchased it I purchased it for pressure canning and I wanted the stainless steel pot instead of aluminum. I also pur purchased online a round rack to fit inside so that I can fit more jars than the metal basket provided. In other words, the metal basket that comes with the Fagor. The metal rack that she bought is not made by Fagor, but it fits perfectly. The pressure cooker makes small canning batches, which is fine for my small family. I just love this product. It has paid for itself many times over. I have canned tomato sauce, pea soup, chicken broth, ground beef, corned beef, chili, pinto beans and baked beans, canned potatoes, etc. I think it's a fantastic product, easy to use, and I have some ready-made meals on the shelf. I was glad to see your Fagor post is a product I really like. I have to say I'm hooked on pressure canning. So yeah, I have not done pressure canning. I don't have a huge need for it myself. Um, I like to cook uh, meat basically fresh, but I'm intrigued by the idea of cooked, of my own canned cooked beans. Uh, this has got my mind thinking here. And tomato sauces, I usually make a quick kind of marinara. Uh, bing, bang, boom, you know, done. Again, there's links for that on the site. But the Fagor has also a canning set, which has a, basically, it's a wire rack that will allow the jars to sit just off the bottom of the pressure cooker. And you need the larger size Fagor pressure cooker to do that. It's called the 10-piece canning set, I believe. Um, I have a, um, a 10 quart and I really like it. And you can also get the slightly smaller one, the eight quart, and it works just as well. Do we have any more? Uh, oh, flaxseed oil. We're talking about cast iron seasoning instructions and whether you can use soap on cast iron. I've gotten so many comments from, can you use soap on cast iron video? Because the answer is yes. And people are like, oh, thank you. I've been using uh, soap on my cast iron for years. I just wouldn't tell anyone. <laughs> so I made it all right. Lots of people writing in and go, you know, my mom has used soap on her cast iron for 20 years. And that's just fine. So it's all right. We talk about uh, the science behind that in that video. Um, excuse me. But Laura writes, and I'm talking about the best oil for cast iron seasoning is flax oil. And she asks, where would I find flaxseed oil? Okay, where would I find flaxseed oil? So far, uh, we only have a local store, but when I travel 100 miles, there's a Walmart, uh, Kmart, and Smith's Food Store, and Albertsons. So far, no one carried the oil. I'll have to look when I go to Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Bet it might be there. I just don't plan to travel that way for a while. Thank you for your blog. I love it. And the adventures with the dogs. So yeah, uh, flaxseed oil, if you're in an urban area, is easier to find. It's going to be in a health food store. It might also be in a regular grocery store if they have like an organic section or a health food section. Flaxseed oil has to be refrigerated. Uh, and the best bet is just to ask somebody in the store that looks like they know what they're talking about. And you'll find it or not. But it has to be kept refrigerated. If you can't use flaxseed oil, a high heat vegetable oil will work as well. It's, um, it's just thought that the flaxseed oil is a bit more bulletproof. But a number of people wrote in and said, you know, Eric, I don't use flaxseed oil in it. And my oil's just fine. People have even used PAM, the cooking spray, you know, like a, a spray on aerosol cooking spray. And that works for them. So good. There you go. All right, so just a couple of little viewer mails and thoughts about reaching out to your neighbors. Um, if anyone here is watching Garden Fork via iTunes or Downcast, if you're watching the videos, I am fixing the feed issues and slowly uploading some videos there. And we're going to have a special announcement for our iTunes video viewers. Um, we're working on a little project for that as well. Um, don't forget, all the videos are on YouTube, and they're also on our site, GardenFork.tv. All right, so thanks for listening again. Uh, the best thing you do to help Garden Fork right now is write a review for our radio show on iTunes. 
There is a bunch of podcasts coming out now. Podcasting is uh, the new cupcake, it seems. And it always helps us in search and suggestions that people stumble across the show. All right. Make it a great day. I'll see you later. Bye. Thanks again for listening. Again, if you want to support Garden Fork uh, by shopping at Amazon.com or at Home Depot, you can uh, either have things shipped from HomeDepot.com or order online and pick it up at your store. Those links are in the show notes for this episode. And also there are ads on the GardenFork.tv site on the right-hand side. All right. Thank you. Garden Fork's theme music is used under license from UniqueTracks.com.